Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's always my pleasure to address the New Hampshire Center for Constitutional Studies. And in a workshop, which is what this is, one hopes that we'll do some work in the sense that the students will learn some techniques from the instructor and not simply go away entertained, as it were, to the extent that I would entertain you. So what I'm going to discuss today, what I call the principles of the constitutional militia, how one uses history, language, and logic in construing the Constitution, and in this case with respect to the subject of the militia. So I'm going to examine the proper method for construing the constitutional term militia, as it occurs in several places in the document, employing the Constitution's language, its logical structure, and a great deal of pre-constitutional colonial and state history. And then secondly, I'm going to close by discussing the significance of all of that for reestablishment of popular self-government in this country today. All right, why is this subject important other than as a kind of propedeutic tool for learning? Well, if you read the Second Amendment, which is where most people start and stop when they think about the militia in a constitutional context, the Second Amendment provides that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The security of a free state, and if you think about that in political terms, what could be more important? All right? But the Second Amendment is not limited solely to the concept of security, it's the security of a free state. And it says that nothing other than a well-regulated militia is necessary for that purpose. So one would think, simply by looking at that part of the Constitution, that it would be fundamentally important for us to find out what is a well-regulated militia. And what is the right of the people to keep and bear arms that's related to this thing that the Constitution says is necessary to the security of a free state. And I harp on that word necessary because you can read the Constitution from beginning to end and that is the only place in the Constitution where the Constitution says that any structure or institution or office is necessary for anything. It does not say Congress is necessary. It does not say the President is necessary. It does not say the Judiciary, the Supreme Court is necessary. The only thing the Constitution says is necessary for any purpose is the militia. So obviously the folks who wrote that provision had some very strong thoughts in mind. Well, how do we go about finding out what those words mean? Well, some terms are actually defined in the Constitution. The obvious one is Congress the House, and the Senate. Why? Because these were institutions which were brand new. There had been a Congress under the Articles of Confederation, but the one under the Constitution was different in form and in authority. So they had to define it very specifically. There was no referent in pre-constitutional history to this institution. Similarly, for the word treason, Treason is defined in Article 3 of the Constitution and very specifically. Why? Because under the pre-constitutional law, essentially the English law, treason was an extraordinary elastic term. There were many, many different kinds of acts that would be, constitute, would consider, be constituting treason or constructive treason. I mean, they had treasons on top of treasons. And the Founding Fathers were very concerned that that category of criminal activity be carefully limited so that it couldn't be used as a political tool of oppression. So they had to define it in a way that would exclude all the other English definitions of treason. But there are some very important words in the Constitution that are not defined. Jury and jury trial, obviously a fundamental consequence at the time, no definition. The writ of habeas corpus, of fundamental importance, unless you'd listen to Mr. Gonzales, the former Attorney General of the United States, but it was of fundamental importance of the Founding Fathers, not defined. Felony, of tremendous consequence, because it defined a whole category of crimes and the punishments that were connected with them, not defined. War, not defined. State, and states, never defined. The freedom of speech, and I emphasize the word the, or the, not a freedom of speech, but the freedom of speech, not defined. The right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government, not defined. 
And of course, the subject of this discussion, a well-regulated militia, Second Amendment, or the militia of the several states, the original constitutional term, not defined. The right of the people to keep and bear arms, not defined. Well, the lack of a glossary in the Constitution ought to tell us that the framers believed that every American who was linguistically and historically and legally literate already knew what those terms meant. Otherwise, they would have had a very long list of definitions at the end of the document. And obviously, the term well-regulated militia must have had a meaning known to everyone at that time. Because can you imagine that the Founding Fathers would have considered something that they believed was necessary to the security of the free state undefinable? Would they have believed that it ought to be left undefined? Would they believe that it should have been left to the changing definitions that the states or Congress might give it from time to time? Well, obviously not, right? So they were thinking in terms of terminology that was well known. All right, so where outside of the Constitution do we find this well-known definition? And typically what you see in constitutional analysis by people who come at it from the direction of original intent, that is, what the constitutional language itself means, is they will turn to some statements that were made by the framers of the Constitution, that is, the people that went to the Constitutional Convention, and they often look, for instance, at Madison's notes, or they'll look at things that Madison, Hamilton, and other people who attended the Constitutional Convention may have written thereafter. Or they will look to people that I would call the founders, and those were prominent Americans who might not have attended the Constitutional Convention, but they were politically important and influential people. And with respect to the Second Amendment, you pick up almost any book that deals with a, a pro-Second Amendment interpretation of the Constitution, an original intent type interpretation. And you'll find that's how the author interprets it. He'll take something from Madison, he'll take something from maybe even Alexander Hamilton. He'll say, well, here's what George Mason said, here's what Thomas Jefferson said, this is what it means. Well, those statements that were written or spoken at the time, they may be historical facts because that's what one framer or founder actually said. We can take that as a given, all right? But fundamentally, what are they? They're opinions, all right? They're opinions. Now, these individuals may in some sense be considered experts on the subject, all right? But that doesn't make their testimony necessarily conclusive on the subject. They could have been overstating the matter to make a political point. Patrick Henry does this all the time if you read the debates in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He's constantly overstating his fear about the Federalists. In some instances he may have been right, but he was a politician and he knew how to make statements of that kind. Right? So these people may have been overstating or misstating in some way. They could have been biased. They could have been honestly wrong or confused. Who knows? All right? Now today, typically, if you have an expert in court, that expert can give his opinion under oath on a particular matter within his area of expertise. But at that point, he's subject to cross-examination by the other side, essentially on two grounds. First, what's the basis of your opinion? What did you use to derive that opinion? And what is the sufficiency of that basis? Right? Such as his analytical technique that he may have used. Right? And a jury can always disregard this expert's testimony. He doesn't have to accept it if the jury determines that the basis or the sufficiency simply isn't enough. Right? So what was the basis for the founders' opinions on the militia and the right to keep and bear arms? What were they using? Well, it was their personal experience, obviously. They weren't talking about theory here. They were talking about an experience they had actually lived. You have to remember that most of these people, at one time or another, had probably served in some colonial or state militia because I'm going to explain to you everybody had a duty to do so. And so their personal experience and their knowledge was actually the result of laws that existed at that time. And in fact, I'm talking about literally hundreds of these laws that extend from the early 1600s right up to the ratification of the Constitution. And that's the best evidence of what that terminology means in the Constitution. What those laws provided those laws are the validation of the founders' opinions. It's not the other way around. All right. 
And they tell us what the Constitution means because they tell us what the founders were implicitly referring to when they put these words into the document. They tell us what a well-regulated militia was in those days. And in fact, you'll find that many of those statutes, that's the title. An act to regulate the militia of whatever the colony was or whatever the state was. That was the terminology that was used. It was well regulation in terms of everything that follows in this act that goes on for eight or ten pages of closely set type. So the statutes tell us precisely what the militia of the several states were, what a well regulated militia was, and what the right to keep and bear arms was at the time. And in terms of these principles, the situation today in 2007 is exactly the same as it was in 1787, in 1777, in 1767, in 1757, in 1657. The principles have not changed since the Constitution was ratified. There has been no amendment of the Constitution that has done anything with respect to the militia or to the principles of the Second Amendment. Well, what were the principles of the pre-constitutional militia that are still the principles today? You find these by reading the statutes. I've read, I think, every one of them in every one of the original 13 colonies. It took a long time to find them. It takes a long time to read them. But the one thing you discover is if you've read one, you've read them all. Essentially, every colony follows the same set of principles. The only difference being in the heavily slave states, Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia, the militia were given specific duties with respect to policing the slaves, which they did not have in the militia statutes of the middle colonies and the northern colonies, notwithstanding that there were a certain number of slaves there. Those statutes, there simply weren't enough for the legislatures to bother creating separate provisions. But what were the provisions that applied across the board? Well, the first one was that these institutions were separately established in every colony and independent state. There was then, and there can be now, no such thing as the militia of the United States in reference to the general government. It's a constitutional impossibility. That's number one. Secondly, they were part of the colonial and the independent states' governmental structures with governmental authority. There was no such thing as a private militia organization. So all these people that are running around in the woods now with camouflage outfits on, as well-intentioned as they may be, they really are not militia and cannot be militia. Thirdly, all of the militia were based upon a duty of universal service. All able-bodied free males were required from 16 to 50, 16 to 60, to be members of and serve in some capacity in the militia. Able-bodied, physically, mentally, capable of performing the function. Free males because they had a lot of slaves. And typically, in that type of a system, the last thing that anyone in his right mind would do would be generally to arm the slaves. Uh, so slaves were, in some cases they were armed, in some cases they performed menial services in the militia. They might serve as musicians. There were, you can find in various statutes specific provisions dealing with slaves, but they were always kept in that capacity. So there was universal service. What was the right to keep and bear arms? This is the fascinating thing. I've looked through all of this literature and I never found a statute that talked about the right to keep and bear arms. They all talk about the duty to keep and bear arms. The requirement that every able-bodied free man is required to have a firearm in his personal possession in his home. And so much ammunition and a bayonet, or if he didn't have a bayonet, he had a tomahawk or a sword. They have a whole list of these things. Gun control in those days was the requirement that you had a gun. All right? But the obverse of that, or the reverse, depending on which side of the coin you want to look at, the reverse of that coin was, if I have an obligation to have a gun, then I have a right as against you to keep my gun. Right? That's where the right to keep and bear arms comes from. I have a right to keep this gun because I have a communal obligation to have this gun. All right? It's fascinating. And that's why the Second Amendment is so coherent. That's why you have to read the first part along with the second. You can't take the right to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed, and put that over here and say, this is the important thing to talk about. Wrong. It's not the right thing to talk about. You have to start with the well-regulated militia concept. But I'll get to that in more detail in a minute. Now, also, all eligible citizens had to be armed with their own firearms. They didn't get them from the government. They bought them themselves. 
Now, if they were too poor to buy them, the government would arrange to sell produce for them, maybe to get them a job. Statutes are interesting in the, all the mechanisms that they had for being sure that individuals could raise enough money to buy their own firearms. The only people to whom government provided firearms were the ones who were so poor they couldn't raise the money. And then they would, the town usually, or the militia sometimes itself, because they raised money through fines on people who didn't comply with their regulations, would buy the gun and give it to the poor individual. But even that poor individual had a government gun in his hand. Where, that gun, where was that gun kept? In his home. Not in an arsenal. It was kept in his home, along with his ammunition, his tomahawk, his bayonet, whatever it was, the list of accoutrements he had. All right? So all citizens had to be armed with their own personal firearms, kept at home at all times. Why? Because in some outlying communities, if you didn't have your gun in your own hands, you had a problem with the Indians or the French attacked. And then, of course, the basic principle was, if you didn't have your own gun in your own hands, if it was in the hands of the potential usurpers and tyrants, it wasn't going to do you much good if you had to resist oppression. Pretty simple concepts, although we've lost all of this subsequently, haven't we? Where did these people come up with these guns? Did they buy them from the government? No, the government wasn't producing guns. They bought the free market. There was a large free market for guns. So you had a system whereby the entire community was armed by private purchases in the market. Now, these firearms, interestingly enough, what type were they? They were the military type of the time. They were muskets. In fact, the militia statutes that allow, and Virginia is an example, that allow people who have rifles to use rifles, as well as muskets, were actually arming the militia better than the average soldier in the British Army. And the average soldier in the British Army didn't have a rifle, he had a musket. Right? Might have been good out to, what, about 100 yards or so, and that was it. You were lucky if you could hit a man at 100 yards with one of those. Rifle, 200, 300 yards. So actually, if you look at it from a technological point of view, a typical militiaman in Virginia might have been better armed than the typical British redcoat in the late 1770s. But they were certainly the type of arms that the military was using. All right? They were at the same technological level. If you look at the present gun control system in the United States, try to go out and buy yourself a fully automatic rifle. It can be done, but it's very, very difficult for the average person. All right? So the average individual in this country doesn't have the opportunity to be as well armed as the average infantryman in the U.S. Army. Now, all eligible citizens, I said, had to maintain the firearms in their own personal possession at home at all times. Oh, by the way, if you were a master, you had an apprentice or a servant, not a slave, but a free servant. Usually apprentices weren't paid. They received room and board and training. You had to buy the gun. The masters had to supply the gun for the apprentices and the servants. If you were a widow, you had to supply the gun for your son. Right. So actually they brought all elements of society into this. If you were one of the exempted individuals, they had a class of people who were exempted from normal militia service. Say you were served in the legislature, or you were a minister, or you were a physician, or you were a ferryman, or a miller. That's fascinating. Millers and ferrymen were always exempted. Why? Because if you didn't have the ferryman, the road was cut. He was the fellow that would take you across the river, right? You had to have that fellow there. The miller, they depended upon him to, to grind wheat and other, other grain. The miller was absolutely essential to the economy, farm-based economy, right? So they couldn't have that fellow removed from the mill. So they left him there permanently. Nevertheless, he had to be armed because there might be a situation that arose called alarms, an immediate attack in the community. He didn't have to show up for training but he had to be armed. And in many instances, people who didn't have to show up for training had to buy guns for others. So that's where some of the supplies for the poor people came from. So they brought everyone into the, into the process. And then finally, they had all eligible citizens had to train and exercise to some degree in the use of their firearms for obvious reasons. One fascinating thing is to see in many of these statutes a specific provision that says the militia arms were exempt from all levies, liens, seizures for judgments, civil or otherwise. So they were exempt from seizure for taxes. It's the only kind of property I ever saw in colonial law that was exempt from all seizures. That's how important they considered the possession of this stuff to be. All right, now this brings us to the Constitution. The Constitution uses this term militia, and it's looking backwards at all of these statutes. This is what the militia 
were in terms of the principles. And that's why it doesn't have to define the militia in some way, just it doesn't have to define the states. Anyone who was alive, an adult in 1787, knew perfectly well what a state was. Certainly knew what the state was in which he lived. He certainly knew what the militia was in the state in which he lived. He was probably a member of it. If he wasn't over 60 years old, he had probably served in it. And the Constitution essentially takes these entities, these establishments, either states or militias, and simply incorporates them as part of the whole system. Now, in the original Constitution, before the Bill of Rights, the terminology that's used is the militia of the several states. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us the militia of state establishments. We're thinking of federalism now, right? Where do these come in the federal structure? They're state establishments. They're state institutions. So the Constitution presumes that they will exist as long as the states exist. And in fact, it assumes that the states will have to maintain them because the states are not in a position to change the Constitution with an, without an amendment individually, correct? So the states are bound by this as well. Now contrast, if you will, take a look at Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, when you have the time. This is the contrast between militia and troops. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 says, No state shall, without the consent of Congress, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace. Yeah, that's a distinction. Militia is this concept that's separate from troops or armies or navies. Right? The Constitution requires the maintenance of the militia. As far as troops are concerned, that's a question for Congress to determine, at least in time of peace. Now, another element in the Federalist or, or the federal structure of, of the militia is that the militia are ultimately under state control. And why is that? Who appoints the officers to the militia? The states. There's only one officer in the militia that is appointed other than by the states. That's the President of the United States. The President of the United States is Commander in Chief of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He's the only member of the general government that has any authority, direct authority in a command structure over the militia. Otherwise, all the officer corps in the militia are state officers. Well, that should tell you something about a situation in which you had a rogue president attempting to misuse the militia for purposes of oppression. Is it very likely that that one man would have a majority of all the state officers agreeing to go along with him? I guess the founding fathers didn't think so, or they wouldn't have structured it that way. Now, of course, on the other side of the federal structure, you have powers and duties of Congress. And they were designed to provide uniformity throughout the country with respect to the militia. It's not the only place in the Constitution that this uniformity theme arises. I mean, one is a classic. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. What is it? No state shall coin money. And then we have Congress has the power to coin money. All right. Why? Because they want a uniform monetary system. Right. Pretty easy. Similarly, the Commerce Clause. Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. That's obvious. They couldn't have 13 or more separate regulations with France. Right? And among the several states. Why? Because they wanted what was called a tariff. Uh, a Zolverein, as the Germans would say. A system where they had no tariffs among the states. You have free trade. All right. So it's great uniformity. Well, the militia structure is exactly the same. Congress has given the power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. Obvious. So there'll be uniformity. Now, it's interesting, the words they used. Congress has the power to organize the militia. Doesn't say create the militia. Doesn't say raise a militia. Organize. It's the thing that's already there. And it needs some structure to be given to it. All right. You contrast that with the power of Congress over the armies and navy of the United States. That language is to raise and support armies, to provide a navy. Those things are contingent. We might not have an army. We might not have a navy. Congress might feel we don't need them. In fact, the Constitution's pretty clear on that subject with respect to an army where it says, I can find it right here and read it exactly, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Why do they say that? Because they were deathly afraid of standing armies and the temporal period for the House of Representatives is two years. And if somebody made a mistake 
in that House of Representatives, two years later they could change their minds and remove the appropriation, the Army would no longer exist. And the Army is a contingent entity. The Navy is a contingent entity. The militia are a permanent entity. And the reason for that was that the militia were to be the ultimate deterrent against standing armies. They just had that experience, right? Against standing armies. Right? So there's the dichotomy. Of course, the militia are state institutions. Does Congress have any authority to create or to control a state institution? I wouldn't think so. An element of the state government? Right? Congress has the power to pass a statute that would restructure the state government? Well, clearly not. Right? So we have a uniformity provision, essentially. And once again, as I pointed out before, that provision for governing the militia shall have power to provide for governing such part of them as shall be in the actual service of the United States. Reserving to the states, that's the important language, reserving to the states, respectively, the appointment of officers. Remember that word, reserving? That's one of those peculiar words of 18th century legalese. The states already had that power. The Constitution was taking some part of it and giving it to Congress and recognizing in the word reserving that the states were keeping all the rest of it. They started off with this power to create the militia and to appoint officers. A very small part of that was transferred to Congress in order to maintain uniformity in the governing of the militia when it was called into the service of the United States, but otherwise the states kept everything they already had had. It's like a restatement of the Tenth Amendment within the body of the Constitution. And actually, that type of thing appears in more places than this. All right, well, what is this actual service of the United States? That's actually the preceding clause, Clause 15 of Section 8. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. You notice, number one, it's a limited number of actions. Not for any purpose whatsoever. And one thing you can see immediately, it's pretty hard to imagine how those things would be done outside of the United States. The militia is not an organization that can be sent off to foreign wars, which is one of the reasons they created the National Guard in 1913, 1903, was because the Attorney General of the United States had so ruled. And the people that were planning for World War I recognized that they weren't going to be able to raise a huge force if they had to depend upon a militia that they couldn't send out of the United States. All right. So those are the three, as it were, jurisdictional elements that can take the militia out of state control and put it into temporary congressional control. And at that point, the president is commander-in-chief. Remember, the president is commander-in-chief of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States, which is for those three reasons only. He's not the commander-in-chief for any other purpose. He's not the decider. I mean, use whatever word you want. It's a very, very limited window of command opportunity that he has. Now, one thing that always struck me about this was, what's the first in that list? Execute the laws of the Union. Provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union. So now we have this major homeland security problem, which focuses to a great degree on executing the laws of the Union, right? So wouldn't one think that if you were setting up a homeland security program and you had the Constitution in this hand and a blank piece of paper in the, well, over here, the other way I write with this hand. Constitution in this hand, a blank piece of paper and pen in this hand. You look at it and say, oh, okay, I want a homeland security program. What is the institution that the Constitution, the establishment of the Constitution designates to execute the laws of the Union? It's not the Army. It's not the Navy. It's not some police force. There's no police force mentioned in the Constitution. It's not the Department of Homeland Security. That hasn't, didn't exist until a couple of years ago. It's the militia of the several states. That's what should have been done. Is that what was done? Okay. You see how far we've been removed. The, I mean, the directions specify it. With, I would call it, uncanny precision. And the politicians and the bureaucrats do something entirely different. Well, now, what are the disabilities of Congress, right? Power, disability. That's the legal terminology. Power, I can do something, such as pass a law that will have a legal effect on you. Disability, I can't in some area. Well, number one is Congress has no power to create a militia of its own, no militia of the United States. That's pretty obvious. We just contrasted that with the Army and the Navy, 
Secondly, its powers are two. The language is Congress shall have power to, and then a list of things that it could do. Not power not to. And if Congress fails to do something through neglect, well, these are state institutions. And under the principles of federalism, what then happens? The states are capable of taking the necessary action. And what happens if the states fail? Well, who is, comprises the militia? It's several, every able-bodied man from 16 to 60. It's we the people. See the federal structure? I mean, this thing is so simple. This is like teaching kindergarten, really. This is so simple. Yet they all understood it in 1787, and very few people understand it today. Now let's take an example of modern gun control. All right? And the example I'd like to give you is the machine gun statute. 1934, National Firearms Act. And in those days, Congress was a little bit leery about how far it could go and how fast it could go, so it figured it had to use some power that was obvious, the taxing power. And they said, all right, if you're going to get a machine gun, you're going to have to pay a tax on this. You're going to have to get a tax stamp, and it's going to have to be registered, and it's going to be subject to control by the Department of Treasury. And this was supposed to keep machine guns out of the hands of criminals and sort of shotguns out of the hands of criminals, and of course it didn't. All it did was provide an inhibition on the non-criminal from getting his hands on one of these firearms. All right. Now what's fascinating about that to me is, number one, the congressional power with respect to all of you who are members of the militia, unless you're over 60, and then you could be voluntary members, you wouldn't be required, but you could be voluntary members if you were able-bodied, is to provide for organizing arming. Let's stop right there. Provide for organizing arming the militia. This statute provides for to a large extent, disarming them by in inhibiting it. Now what's also fascinating, if you go to the taxing power of Congress, which is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, they consider that to be pretty important, they put it right up front, all right? Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Follow that? They have the power to lay and collect taxes to provide for the common defense. So it would follow from this provision alone that they couldn't use a taxing power to disarm the American people, right? So whichever end of the stick you look at this problem, they're wrong, all right? So that's half of the whole gun control structure in the United States based on taxes, all unconstitutional. The other half of the gun control structure in the, Constitution, uh, in the United States is based upon the constitutional provision regulate commerce and the main statute of the 1968 Gun Control Act, I think they call it the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. Everybody calls it the 1968 Gun Control Act because it didn't make the streets any safer. All right. And actually, if you go to, what is that, Jews for the uh, per personal, uh, per yeah, right. Uh, they have done a study there, Aaron Zellman has done a study there to show that Thomas Dodd, the senator from Connecticut who wrote this 68 bill, actually drew upon the Nazi gun control bill under Hitler. So we have a good, there's a good connection there. But in any event, the theory there is they're regulating commerce. And so what they do is to require gun dealers to have a federal firearms license, and so they're regulated by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is actually a treasury agency, tax agency. And then you, as a common citizen, cannot buy a firearm across state lines except under certain regulations. And generally speaking, you have to work through one of these federal firearms license holders. All right. Well, now, if you look at those or that structure. The first thing that comes to mind is, well, of course, the militia are not commerce. <laughs> right? The militia are state agencies. Right? They're not commerce. How is, how is Congress regulating the behavior of the militia under a commerce power? That's another one of those we don't have an answer. Right? But then the other side is, if you go back historically, how did the militia arm itself or themselves? Because there was one in each state. How did they do it? I just told you a little while ago. Come on now. I just told you. Give me the answer. They bought these arms in the private market. They were personal possessions of the militia members. All right? So to regulate that kind of behavior is a direct attack on the whole militia concept. And if it's a direct attack on the whole militia concept, it's a direct attack on what is necessary to the security of a free state, and therefore they're undermining the freedom of everyone in this country. I mean, this is kindergarten stuff. You don't have to go to Harvard Law School. In fact, if you go to Harvard Law School, you'll learn the opposite. <laughs> no, you won't, because they don't even talk about this. 
Never. I was there, I took all sorts of constitutional courses, and they never discussed the Second Amendment. Now let's look at the president for a moment. The decider, excuse me, the decider. <laughs> and we have a lot of talk out there about the president's inherent powers as commander-in-chief. Right? This is the theory. I'm the commander-in-chief, and that gives me some kind of power. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. He's not the Duce, he's not the Fuhrer, he's a constitutional commander-in-chief. So we don't look to these other models, bad as they are, we look to the document that delegates authority to him. And with respect to the militia, it is to be commander-in-chief of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. And who decides when that is? Congress! It's not the decider, Congress is the decider. All right? So he has no power whatsoever except what Congress gives him. And then only in those three particulars. And it's interesting that that word actual is put in there. It wasn't enough for them to say when called into the service of the United States, they had to say when called into the actu actual service. They were emphasizing this. We're not gonna give this fellow authority unless it's the actual service. So don't come to me with some kind of double talk that this is the service of the United States. It has to be the actual service. It's fascinating because that's a redundant term in a sense. Right? So it's there for very special emphasis. They didn't trust the president, notwithstanding that a lot of people like Washington. Why? Because the last decider they had was George III. Right? That, that, was the, that was the example of executive power that they faced. There was no executive, remember, under the Articles of Confederation. Executive power was excised by Congress. But there was no executive, and probably for a very good reason. All right? Now, why is it there at all, this commander-in-chief language? Isn't this some part of the executive power? He loves to tell us that now. Right? The executive power, I have all these inherent powers. Well, wrong again. Because if it hadn't been there, he wouldn't have been the commander-in-chief of the militia. Why? Isn't it an inherent power of the executive? No, you've got to go back to the English law. English law, at that time, constitutional period, the king had all power over war and peace. He could unilaterally declare war. He was the generalissimo of all forces on land and sea, and they had a militia in England going back to the yeomanry. So the king really was the decider, the unitary executive in that area. Congress, excuse me, the Constitution took all of those powers away from the king. Who declares war? Congress. Who raises armies? Congress. Who provides for the Navy? Congress. Who writes the regulations for the land and naval forces? Congress. Who calls out the militia? Congress. Who organizes the militia? Congress. Who regulates the militia? Congress. There's nothing left. All right? If they hadn't given that specific power to the president in the Constitution, he would have had nothing. Congress could have declared a committee of itself to be the commander-in-chief of the army. Why not? Because it now had all power granted to it. The presidential power in this country under the Constitution is very, very small. The congressional power is very, very large. We don't really have a tripartite government in the sense that they're all equal. We have a government of legislative supremacy. If you look for where the ultimate powers are, they all are in Congress. And the ultimate, ultimate power is impeachment. Throw them out. And then what can he do? Nothing. All right? Now, what is interesting here, though, going back to the Homeland Security point that I made a little bit earlier, the president is commander-in-chief of the militia when called into the actual service of the United States. What's the first reason for calling the militia into the active service of the United States? To execute the laws of the Union, right? The beauty of the Constitution it always puts things in the right priority. Right? First thing that's of consequence is executing the law. Right? Let's follow the law first, and then other things will follow. Probably good things. Right? First power of the militia, first responsibility, execute the laws of the Union. If you go to Article 2, Section 3, power of the President, or duty of the President, the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. You think these two things mesh by accident? You think the President is given the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, that he's made commander in chief of the militia when called into the actual service of the United States, and that the first responsibility of the militia is to execute the laws of the Union. You think that's an accident? 
Or was that written by somebody or a group of people that had a very particular structure in mind that they wanted to see implemented? And now we have a situation in Washington where they've created this whole bureaucratic uh, what, pyramid, if you will, Department of Homeland Security, has no connection whatsoever to the militia. In fact, in one interesting sense, maybe has no connection even to the President of the United States. It essentially delegated all this authority over to well, Mr. Chertoff or whoever fills that, that chair, right? And it was quite obvious that that isn't the plan that was devised, at least not the blueprint that was given to us. Now, what about the relationship of the militia to the armed forces? Regular armed forces, Army and Navy, as the Constitution refers to them. Is one the part of the other? Is one an adjunct of the other? Is one related to the other? The answer is no. The basic principle, you read this in stories, commentaries, Joseph's story, who served on the Supreme Court with John Marshall. 1830s, 33, I think his first version of this of his commentaries. He has a little section on the Second Amendment. He says the reason for the militia is to be the deterrent force against standing armies and to stand up against oppression of one kind or another by some leader who will use a standing army to attempt to work his will against the people. So they understood that these two en entities, the regular armed forces, whatever they might be called, and the militia were not only separate and independent but to a certain extent antagonistic. That the purpose of this one the huge number of people armed and trained was to keep this one in line. All right? So the first thing that comes to mind then is, well, of course, it makes perfect sense that the powers of Congress that deal with the Army and the Navy and the regulation thereof are separate and distinct from the powers of Congress that deal, deal with the militia and the arming and organizing and regulation thereof, and also that the status of the president as commander-in-chief of the army and navy is different from the status of the president as commander-in-chief of the militia. If it were one agglomeration or it could be made one agglomeration, why would you have this separation? Why would the president have two different hats? The commander-in-chief of the militia and the commander-in-chief of the army and navy. Why not just commander-in-chief, as he seems to think he is? All right. All right, so they come from different sources. They come from different powers. And the most important thing of all is, the militia cannot be brought under the command of the Army and the Navy. Why? Who appoints the officers in the Army and the Navy in the United States? The President of the United States, he goes to the Senate, and they have to be confirmed. All right? That's the way it operates. Who appoints the officers in the militia of the several states? The states. You see a difference there? Okay? So it follows that if the states appoint the officers in the militia, under no circumstance can an officer in the regular armed forces command in the militia. Right? He can't have the command of an officer, even if he doesn't have the particular badge or title. He can't have command. This is kind of the Michael New problem. You're all familiar with Michael New? Michael New is because he's an enlisted man. And it was one of these uh, adventures in the Balkans. And, uh, Clinton? Was it? I think it was under Clinton. It was under Clinton. Clinton was sending some American army people to this UN-sponsored operation in the peacekeeping operation in the Balkans. And they were required, our people were required to wear some kind of UN insignia, which immediately raised the question, well, who's in command here? Right? Now, it's pretty clear under our Constitution that no supranational entity can possibly come in. I don't care whether there's a treaty or not. Treaty can't override the Constitution. New was merely an enlisted man. He said, I'm not going to go along with this. I'm not going to wear these insignia. And in a way, that's really shocking to me because he was an enlisted man. What about the officers? You have to wait for some enlisted man to do this? They court-martialed him and threw him out of the army. All right? The theory being, I guess, that our armed forces might have to take directives from the UN. Well, apparently not the militia. I mean, the founding fathers saw at least far enough ahead to realize that it wasn't going to work there. The militia is not going to take any orders from the UN because their officers have to be appointed by the states. All right. <coughs> Fundamentally important point, which we have to keep in mind because I think we'll be seeing more of this as time goes on, these problems as time goes on. Now, I want to cover here just one, what I call, common fallacy. You can go on the Internet without much trouble. You type in the word militia and you'll get you know, thousands of hits. All over the country, there are these 
groups that are calling themselves militia. Militia of this state or that state or militia of some part of some state. And I'll leave aside the question of whether you know, some of these people are kooks. There are kooks everywhere. You may be listening to one, in manner of speaking. <laughs> and I assume that they're all operating out of completely laudable motives and they're all attempting to comply as much as they can with you know, basic legal principles. But their fundamental idea is that a bunch of private citizens can go off somewhere and form a militia that has some legal significance. And the short answer is, as far as I've been able to determine, I've waded through all of this pre-constitutional literature. There's no such example of that ever happening. Even the people that came out on April the 19th in Concord and Lexington were part of the Massachusetts militia. There was a statute. General Gage didn't particularly like that statute, he didn't want it enforced. But that was their authority. And they were operating on the base of that authority. It wasn't a group of vigilantes. It wasn't a group of private citizens. All right. Well, I have never been able to find any evidence to that degree. And then, of course, you run into an interesting question. If these people actually are outside of the government, and that's the way they treat themselves, they don't treat themselves as, as being outside of the government, then what legal authority could they possibly have? I mean, other than as private citizens, I mean, we all have you know, legal authority to own property and so forth. And so forth. But in terms of forming an organization and doing something with it, what legal authority do they have? Well, they have none. And this raises a very interesting question. Let's say you have a crisis that occurs. And we have this group. And the police show up. And they say, well, now we want you to do something. We want you to direct traffic over here while we arrest these tax protesters. And we want you to use this private group. They now find themselves what? performing exactly the function of the oppressors, I guess, right? Because they have no authority to resist. Right? If they resist the police order, I take it they could be arrested. We'll assume that for the purposes of this argument, right? But they certainly have no legal authority of their own. The whole principle, as you read in the story is the classic example, he has just one little paragraph, but he sets it out so beautifully. The purpose, ultimate purpose of this structure was to, as, uh, Nancy Reagan used to say, was to be able to just say no. Right? When the oppressor came forward and said, do this, the answer was no. And there was a rather large deterrent effect behind this no, because there might be thousands or tens of thousands or millions of armed people who would also echo no. Right? And then the oppressor would have to fish or cut bait, as it were. So that was the, that was the theory, and of course the private militia concept runs exactly contrary to that. That is, they can't form a check or balance because they have no, no legal authority to check or balance. They can either go along with what they're told to do and become part of the problem, or they can refuse to go along and become the target. And also, if you read most of the material that these people put out, they tend to focus on what I would call playing soldier, playing soldier. They're focusing on essentially paramilitary type of activities and they're out training with firearms and survival skills and all the rest of that. And that's fine. But if you understand the militia concept fundamentally, it was a matter of organizing people not simply to play soldier but to exercise self-government every day of the year. And I'll get to that in a moment. And of course these private groups are the perfect targets of agents provocateur. Right? I mean, you, BATF and the FBI and so forth and the certain private organizations that we need to mention are always looking to infiltrate someone into one of these groups so that he can create an untoward situation. And that's the reason that they can't recruit. That's the reason they can't get beyond a very small number. is because the average citizen looks at this and says, oh my goodness, look at the kind of people who are in there, look at what they're doing, and they have no legal authority. Why am I going to join this kind of an organization and perhaps subject, subject myself to certain situations I don't want to become involved in? Now that brings me to really the second point of this talk, the final point, what I call political reconstruction. The problem we have in this country is really very simple. This is a country that is based upon popular self-government. And when the population stops engaging in that activity, it all goes to hell in a handbasket very quickly. 
You will have government one way or the other. Either you will govern yourselves or somebody else is going to govern you. Either you will have the system of popular self-government the Constitution sets up, or you will have some system of government imposed from the top down. There is no third alternative unless it's total social chaos, which I think nobody wants. All right? And my proposition is that the militia ultimately are political institutions that are necessary for self-government. Why? Because elections, even if they're free and fair, are not enough. What goes on between the elections is important. You can elect Joe Dokes, who tells you he's going to do A, B, and C. He no sooner gets into office, he starts doing minus A, minus B, and minus C. It may not matter, it may not be that important, but it may be extraordinarily serious, because he starts dropping nuclear bombs somewhere in the world. And then the question is, what mechanism is available during those two years, four years, or six years? to bring the rogue public officials, the rogue governmental agencies, into conformity with their legal requirements. And this is especially of concern when the checks and balances within the governmental apparatus break down. The executive starts doing something, the legislature refuses to pass the corrective statutes or to impeach this fellow, the judiciary throws up its hands and says, this is a political question, we can't decide this, and the executive runs off and does whatever he wants as commander-in-chief. Fuhrer or Duce, I mean, you use whatever word you want, right? What's supposed to happen for those four years? The country is supposed to sink deeper and deeper into chaos? Become involved in endless war? Have its economy destroyed? I mean, uh, we're just supposed to sit here and do nothing? And the founding fathers, this is the plan they gave us? And oh, for four years you can't do anything? They were that stupid? Well, of course they weren't. I mean, I just went through this with you, right? They obviously weren't that stupid. They set up this other mechanism and made it permanent. Remember, it was only a statutory mechanism. The militia were statutory creatures in pre-constitutional times. Under their political philosophy, I guess they had a moral duty to legislate for them. But they weren't part of the English Constitution such as it was. But the Founding Fathers elevated that whole structure from a merely statutory position to a constitutional position. They didn't leave it with Congress or with the state legislatures to set up militias if those people thought it was a useful thing to do. They incorporated the militia structure into the Constitution itself so that that couldn't be changed by Congress or the state legislatures. So they obviously considered it was fundamentally important to maintaining the entire structure. And that's what we do not have today. In fact, we have exactly the opposite. 